December 17, 1999. Twelve men from the Chinese province of Fujian make their way to a loading area near the port of Hong Kong. They are led by a number of so-called snakeheads, criminal mercenaries who specialize in the smuggling of illegal aliens. For an exorbitant fee, the snakeheads have agreed to sneak the men onto a ship bound for the U.S. Not as passengers, but as human cargo. Under cover of darkness, the snakeheads hustle the men into their home for the next two weeks. A 10 foot by 40 foot shipping container. I don't believe that the people that are actually ushered into these containers are fully aware of the circumstances under which they will be traveling. I think that they are so concerned about getting here that they're willing to take whatever risks are necessary. After a few hours, the loading is complete and the doors are closed. The container has a canvas top that will allow the men enough air during transit. It can then be cut open, giving the men a way out when they reach their destination, Seattle, Washington. Their only link to the outside world is a cell phone to be used to contact snakeheads in Seattle when they arrive. Their only comforts are a few vital supplies. This particular container had down comforters, water, food, rice crackers, and receptacles for uh, elimination of human waste. The next day, the container, which is owned by a Tokyo-based shipping company called NYK Limited, is lowered into the hull of a ship called the OOCL Faith. Agents of the company have been told the container holds a shipment of knitting machinery units. Eight more containers are piled on top. Trapped inside, the men from Fujian province brace themselves for the 14-day, 6,000-mile voyage, a hellish journey into an uncertain future. They were in utter fear of their lives and what was going to happen to them during the passage, but they had already been committed. There was no turning back. Trafficking in human cargo is just one of the many criminal rackets that have made the Chinese mob a global force. The best way to sum up Chinese organized crime is that they are a supermarket of crime. They are willing to commit murder for hire, kidnapping, extortion, loan shocking, money laundering, white color crime, computer crime, any crime which will help them to achieve any kind of financial gain. But over the last two decades, the business of alien smuggling in particular has boomed. Thousands of Chinese immigrants are smuggled into the United States each year through loose-knit pipelines facilitated by a global network of snakeheads. It's a very large criminal enterprise. Um, it's happening uh, virtually on every land border and seaport and international airport in the United States today. The vast majority of those who try to make it to the U.S., like the 12 men in the OOCL faith, come from the coastal province of Fujian. For centuries, migrants from Fujian have taken to the sea in search of a better life. Today, they look to the land they call Gold Mountain, the United States, where the average worker makes over 10 times more than the average Fujianese. Even the smallest salary here can, can help um, whole villages um, back in, in the province of Fujian. Even the worst conditions here are better than the best conditions there. The rewards of a successful journey can be great, a new life in America, and money to send back home to China. But the risks are also enormous. Snakeheads command huge fees for their services. By bringing 10 or 20 or 30 Chinese into the United States, at you know approximately forty thousand dollars per person that's a significant profit margin typically a family or village in china or a sponsor in the united states will scrape together enough for a down payment to smuggle one of their sons into the u.s before the young man can begin sending money back home however he first has to pay off the rest of the debt to the snakehead all too often the result is a kind of indentured servitude long hours of labor in restaurants and sweatshops, an illegal alien at the mercy of a criminal syndicate. With alien smuggling comes extortion, comes kidnapping, comes serious crimes of violence to include death. It's not simply 
putting an illegal alien into a boat and bringing him to a beach. It's a very involved criminal activity. Despite the dangers, the men entombed aboard the OOCL Faith were still willing to subject themselves to the harrowing journey across the Pacific. They knew that that was the risk they had to take to get to what they felt was the most important thing in their lives, and that was the United States. But after 12 days at sea, their scheme began to unravel. On December 29, 1999, the NYK Shipping Company learned that containers listed as holding knitting machinery units on a ship that arrived near Los Angeles in fact held Chinese illegal aliens. The company contacted the U.S. Department of Immigration and Naturalization about similar shipments headed for Seattle. There were an additional three containers that were shipped by the same company, listing the same type of contents. One of those containers was aboard the OOCL Faith. 6.30 a.m., January 2nd, 2000. The OOCL Faith docks in Seattle. INS and U.S. Customs officials are there waiting and wondering what they'll find. Finally, after two hours, the container is hoisted from the ship and rolled 100 yards away. Wearing masks to protect themselves from airborne diseases, customs agents cautiously break the lock. There are a lot of unknown factors before you open the container. You don't know whether or not there are going to be people in there in need of medical attention or whether or not they, they could be people that are armed. When the doors swing open, the stench of rotting garbage and human excrement fills the air. Translators shouting in Mandarin order the men to come out. I think one of the things that did strike me was the deplorable conditions that these people had to travel in. The fact that one entrepreneur would actually do this to, to human beings for money is something that was very difficult for, for me to deal with. Somehow, all 12 men have survived the journey. But now they face a journey of another kind. Four weeks and 6,000 miles from home, they are taken into custody by the INS and detained as stowaways. That week, the OOCL Faith was just one of four ships to arrive in Seattle carrying human cargo. The INS arrested three snakeheads involved in the operation, two of whom would later plead guilty to alien smuggling and be sentenced to two years in prison. But even if the INS had broken one ring of human smugglers, new snakehead pipelines are being created all the time. I like to describe Chinese organized crime as the flu virus because they are constantly mutating into different groups and different alliances, and, uh, and therefore they are very difficult to investigate. Today, there are hundreds of such groups operating in cities around the globe. But the origins of the Chinese underworld can be traced to one in particular, a secret criminal syndicate with a mysterious mythical past, the Triads. Today's Chinese underworld is made up of hundreds of different criminal organizations, but its roots can be traced back to just one, an ancient brotherhood called the Heaven and Earth Association, better known to Westerners as the Triads. The origins of China's most notorious gang have long been subject to debate. According to the legend familiar to many Chinese, the story begins in 1671 at a Shaolin monastery in Fujian province. There, a group of Buddhist monks is living a life of simplicity and seclusion. When not meditating, they're busy perfecting the style of martial arts that would come to be known as Kung Fu. One day, the monks learn that barbarian armies are nearing the capital, Peking, and threatening to overrun the Qing Empire. This was a cataclysm. The imperial armies were not strong enough to withstand this. And so a desperate emperor turns to anybody he can find who can help quell this invasion. Driven by patriotic duty, the monks of the Shaolin Temple answer the call, using Kung Fu to beat back the barbarian forces without losing a single man. 
A grateful emperor offers the new heroes riches and lofty titles. Yet the monks refuse. Instead, they return to their isolated life at Shaolin, unaware of the treachery of the emperor's advisors. These evil officials around the emperor suggested to him that if they were powerful enough to do this, God knows how else they might use their powers. So it would be better if we got rid of them. The emperor, who was Manchurian and not native Chinese, acts quickly, fearing a rebellion from within. He sends the SWAT team down to Fujian armed with poison and gunpowder and in a celebratory banquet, the guests get the monks drunk and then later that night set fire to the temple. Flames engulf the monastery, killing nearly all of the Shaolin monks. The five who survive walk for days to escape the emperor's troops. Finally, they stop to rest by a stream where they discover an incense burner floating in the water. Emblazoned on the bottom are Chinese characters that read, overthrow the Qing, restore the Ming. What that incense burner indicated to these guys was it said, look, this is heaven. Heaven is giving a mandate to us. To the monks, that mandate is clear. Depose the emperor who betrayed them and reestablish the Ming dynasty, thereby returning China to native rule. Out of this patriotic charge comes a new brotherhood, which the five monks spread to every corner of China. For centuries, versions of this story have shaped the mystique of the triads. Historians, however, say the legend of the Shaolin monks is simply that, a legend. In fact, they say, there's nothing noble about the birth of the triads. Chinese organized crime members like to identify themselves with these ancient heroes and uh, warriors in order to glamorize their criminal activities. And I think all that is just garbage. According to scholars, the true story of the triads begins in Fujian province during the 1700s. It was an age of economic upheaval, and young men on the fringes of society were forced to hit the road in search of work. But in Fujian, the road was a dangerous place a world of bandits and thieves. Fujian is the Wild West of China in the 1700s. One is subject at all times to being insulted, to being bullied, to being robbed, to being taken advantage of, to being swindled, to being even killed. For protection, the young men banded together into mutual aid societies. These were like surrogate families, brotherhoods bound by sworn oaths of loyalty. If you were in the marketplace and someone was trying to cheat you, you could say, if you keep cheating me, I'm going to call my brothers, and at the end of the marketplace today, they're going to whack you in the head. Soon, societies founded for self-defense began to commit crimes of their own. The kind of men who would have joined these societies and who needed these societies were not choir boys. These were people at the bottom of society. Here at this temple, it is said, a group of itinerant monks formed a secret brotherhood in 1761. They called it the Heaven and Earth Association, a name inspired by the traditional Chinese view of the cosmic order, heaven above, earth below, and humans in the middle. To represent this relationship, the Heaven and Earth Association took as its emblem an equilateral triangle a symbol that in time gave rise to its Western name, the Triads. It wasn't long before branches of this new brotherhood began sprouting throughout Fujian province. There was no uh, godfather, no pope, no central figure. The society was founded as a series of small autonomous units or cells that seemed to appear almost at random. New recruits were initiated in a solemn ritual, elements of which are still used by the triads to this day. The ritual often began with the initiates crossing beneath raised swords, symbolically passing into their new family. An animal was then sacrificed, its blood drained and mixed with wine and incense ash. The initiates pricked their fingers, adding their own blood to this mixture. Finally, after swearing never to betray the secrets of the brotherhood, they drank. 
For decades, the Heaven and Earth Association managed to pass under the government's radar. But in 1787, the emperor discovered its existence. With its messianic mythology, the legend of the Shaolin monks, the mysterious secret society seemed to pose a challenge to the ruling dynasty. So if they launched a sort of witch hunt along the coast of Fujian, where in some places they went literally from house to house, searching out people supposedly associated with the Heaven and Earth Society. But the witch hunt backfired badly. The more the government or anybody else tries to, uh, to stamp it out, the more it seems to spread and thrive. Individual members went underground, scattering across China, and carrying with them the secrets of their criminal brotherhood. Almost overnight, the government's failed crackdown turned the Heaven and Earth Association into China's most famous and notorious secret society. Over the next century, the triads would spread throughout Southeast Asia and take root in American Chinatowns. Their illicit activities included everything from drug dealing to prostitution to gambling. As the group that defined Chinese organized crime, the triads spawned dozens of imitators. In time, one of these would come to control the white gold of China's opium trade, and with it, the most decadent city in the world, Shanghai. In the early 1900s, just as it is today, Shanghai was mainland China's most cosmopolitan city. It was also its most dangerous, decadent, and corrupt. It was the place where East met West in China, and there was a great deal of excess. Every vice was catered to, and that is no exaggeration. The city was really three worlds in one, British, French, and Chinese territories, each overseen by its own police force. It was a perfect breeding ground for criminality. A bandit could go and commit a crime in one jurisdiction, slip across into the other, and escape arrest. Over time, a single gang would come to dominate the city's flourishing underworld. And one ambitious gangster would become the most powerful crime boss China has ever known. With the rise of the triads in the late 1700s, secret societies began springing up throughout China. One of the largest was the notorious Green Gang. The Green Gang began as a benevolent association for the boatmen who worked the Grand Canal, the inland waterway that carried tribute rice from central China to Peking. When the advent of steamships threw the boatmen out of work, many headed for the city. These Green Gang members began to filter into Shanghai, where they became, first of all, fairly normal laborers, but quickly began to spread into the rackets of the city. Their experience in shipping and transport made Green Gang members perfect for Shanghai's thriving opium trade. Opium was the biggest business in Shanghai. And then out of the opium business were various ancillary criminal enterprises, armed robbery, prostitution, numbers operations, loan sharking. The list goes on and on and on. By the mid-1920s, Green Gang members controlled rackets in all three sections of Shanghai. In a city the size of Al Capone, Chicago, the Green Gang ran the show. The Green Gang was able, in an amazingly short period of time, to change from an old-fashioned North Chinese group of sworn brothers into one of the most powerful criminal organizations in the world. At the center of it all was a gangster with more power and influence than Scarface could ever dream of, Du Yu Sheng. Du grew up orphaned and illiterate in Pudong, a poor farming village across the Huangpu River from Shanghai. He moved to the city at the age of 14. By day, the boy known as Big Eared Du worked in a shop cleaning and peeling fruit. At night, he indulged in the city's vices, smoking opium and gambling. He was essentially an immoral person, and Shanghai was definitely an immoral city. Around 1910, Du was sworn into the secret criminal brotherhood of the Green Gang. 
Soon afterwards, the resourceful young Hood began working for the powerful boss of the city's French sector, Huang Jinrong, or as he was known behind his back, pockmarked Huang. Huang was one of the most feared gangsters in Shanghai. It didn't hurt that he was also the chief detective for the Chinese police squad in the French sector of the city, also known as the French Concession. Huang Jinrong was valuable not just because he could provide information to the French police, but because he could manage the underworld of the French concession. And in the French concession, the gangsters didn't buy off the police, they were the police. Du Yuashang curried favor with the crime boss, eventually becoming Huang's right-hand man. But he was merely biding his time. In Shanghai, loyalty could only take you so far. And in 1924, when his mentor made a fateful mistake, Du saw a chance to make his move. It all began with a night at the opera. Huang Jinrong, the old godfather, was a fan of opera. In fact, he had his own opera house that he built, partly to please an opera star with whom he was infatuated. He had his own private box, and he would go two, three nights a week to hear her perform. On this particular night, the son of the biggest warlord in the region happened to be in the audience. When their performance ended, the young man and his entourage began booing loudly and shouting catcalls at Huang's favorite star. Furious at the insult, Huang ordered his bodyguards to teach the arrogant prince a lesson. They dragged him outside and beat him viciously. But for once, Huang had gone too far. At the time, warlords were the most powerful figures in China. They had controlled the country since 1911, when nationalist rebels overthrew the last Qing emperor, but failed to create a unified national government. So two nights later, when the warlord kidnapped Huang and locked him up, there was nothing the gangster could do. It was a major humiliation for him I mean, talk about loss of face. Here he is, um, Park Mark Wang, the most powerful person in the French concession, thrown into prison. This threw a kind of terror into most of the members of the criminal organization that he controlled. The Chinese texts described them as running around like ants on a hot stove. What are we going to do now? The, our boss is, has been taken away. Du Yuasheng, however, didn't panic. The moment of opportunity arrived, he seized it. He knew he could displace Huang Jinrong. First, Du paid the warlord to free Huang Jinrong. Things were never the same after that because naturally, Park Mart Wang had to show his gratitude to Du Yu Sun. From that day on, Du Yu Sun was really the head of the Green Gang. It was a brilliantly orchestrated coup, but Du didn't stop there. He also got the warlord to agree to provide military protection for opium shipments coming into the city. In this way, he was able to seize control of Shanghai's most lucrative racket. And he would soon forge an alliance that ensured it would remain his for years to come. In 1923, Nationalist Party troops had joined forces with communist rebels in a campaign to defeat the warlords and reunite China. The coalition swept north, eventually seizing the region that surrounded Shanghai. But the alliance was always a tenuous one. The leader of the Nationalist Army, General Chiang Kai-shek, was wary of the communists and feared for his own position if they succeeded in taking Shanghai. In 1927, Chiang quietly contacted the most powerful underworld figure in the city, Du Yuasheng. The general asked Du to use the Green Gang's muscle against the communists, who were then staging a massive strike in the Chinese section of Shanghai. Du agreed. He had his own interests at stake. The future of the opium monopoly that he more or less enjoyed in Shanghai was threatened, of course, by communist victory. 4 a.m. April 12, 1927. Somewhere in the heart of Shanghai, a piercing whistle shatters the pre-dawn silence. At this signal, thousands of Green Gang members swarm into the Chinese section of Shanghai, launching a brutal attack on communist strikers. The massacre known as White Terror was on. 
Deuce henchmen took men out into the streets and bayoneted them, shot them. One observer said that heads rolled in the gutters like ripe plums. In a matter of hours, Deuce men slaughtered nearly 5,000 people. The gangster had delivered the city to Chiang Kai-shek. Now he would get his reward. In April 1927, Shanghai crime boss Du Yuesheng orchestrated the savage slaughter that came to be called White Terror. Green gang members killed thousands of communists, allowing Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist forces to seize control of the city. As a reward for his role, Du was granted the rank of general in the nationalist army. And with that came the one thing the gangster craved more than anything, respectability. It is the single event that sets him on a pedestal above the rest and begins to make him feel that he's now a man of politics. He's not just a man of crime. The uneducated gangster now set about becoming a Shanghai gentleman. He hired scholars to write essays about his family, even if he himself couldn't read. He gave so much money to charity that by 1931, he was listed in Who's Who in China as a generous philanthropist. He would eventually become the director of five banks and a university, as well as a high-ranking member of the Chamber of Commerce. All the while, he remained a fixture of Shanghai's swirling social scene. Here we have this man who started out at the very bottom of society and is now suddenly becoming cafe society leader of Shanghai. When he walks into a nightclub, everybody says, there he is, there's the man. But behind the facade of respectability, Du's gangster roots remained. Du is referred to as a Chinese Horatio Alger. Well, that's true, but he was also a Chinese Al Capone. From his base in the French sector, Du maintained an ironclad grip on Shanghai's underworld. Anyone who crossed him risked an especially grisly form of Shanghai justice. The equivalent of kneecapping in Shanghai was to cut every tendon in your body, leaving you sort of a helpless mass of jelly on your doorstep. For Chiang Kai-shek, the fear inspired by Du and his henchmen became a useful fundraising tool. The nationalists needed the Green Gang for muscle, since many of Shanghai's wealthiest citizens lived in sections of the city not under Chinese control. Who could enter the French concession and kidnap or kill a banker with impunity? Du Yuesheng's men. Du Yuesheng became the instrument of terror that frightened the Shanghai capitalist class. Du's ties to the nationalists also helped him line his own pockets. In the wake of white terror, the gangster came to head the so-called Opium Suppression Committee, the agency in charge of all the illegal opium confiscated by nationalist authorities. Du already had a monopoly on Shanghai's opium trade. Now, under the guise of a respectable government post, he also had control over the huge amounts of the drug being seized by the nationalists. It turns into an amazing kind of deal. It's sort of like the using cocaine from an evidence room and the police force to sell it on the streets again. By the beginning of the 1930s, Du's hold on Shanghai's underworld seemed unbreakable. He had become China's most powerful gangster and one of Shanghai's most influential citizens. But the coming years would see his criminal empire shattered and his dreams of honor destroyed. In 1937, long simmering tensions between China and Japan erupted into war. On August 14th, the Japanese launched a fierce attack on Shanghai. Refugees from the Chinese section of the city fled to the international zones, hoping to hide from the Japanese threat. With his city under siege, Du Yuesheng mobilized the underworld. Green gang members fought on the front lines for the Chinese army and formed guerrilla units to resist the Japanese occupiers. But it wasn't enough. After three months of brutal fighting, Shanghai finally fell. Du Yuesheng, along with other city leaders, boarded a freighter and fled to Hong Kong. 
the Chinese underworld would never be the same. In September 1945, a month after the end of World War II, Du Yuesheng returned to Shanghai for the first time in eight years. He expected a hero's welcome from the city he'd once tried to save, but that was not to be. To his surprise, the crowds that saw him booed him because they felt he had abandoned them, that he had left them to live under the Japanese and gone off to Hong Kong and didn't have to go through the suffering they'd endured. In April 1949, as Mao Zedong's communists were seizing control of China, Du left Shanghai for the last time. He had long since lost his power. Some say he was even broke, and his health was failing after decades of opium abuse. He died in Hong Kong two years later, at the age of 66. Though he was not much mourned at the time, his legend has endured. Du was the quintessential Shanghai character. He epitomized the city. The Communist Revolution ended the reign of the Green Gang in Shanghai, but it didn't destroy the Chinese underworld. With hundreds of gangs operating overseas, power now shifted from the mainland to the Chinese diaspora. In time, a wave of immigration would turn New York City's Chinatown into a hotbed of Chinese organized crime and one murderous young hood would go to war for control of it all. New York City, 1977. Down on Mott Street, in the heart of Chinatown, a war is raging. There were Chinese gangs everywhere. They were shooting each other to pieces. In the middle of it all is an ambitious young gang lord named Nicky Louie. This is his neighborhood. It's like uh, John Gotti sits in front of uh, the Ravenite Club. This guy sat on Mott Street. At just five foot seven, 120 pounds, Nicky Louie hardly looks the part of an underworld legend. But his charisma and his seeming invincibility make him one of the most feared figures in Chinatown, a hub of Chinese organized crime in America. Yin Poi Lui came to America as a teenager in the late 60s. Soon to be known as Nicky, he was part of a wave of immigrants then flooding what for decades had been a sleepy, self-contained neighborhood. Chinatown was a town within the city of New York, and it could operate and you can live within it and never have to speak English and, and do very well for your whole life. The size of the Chinese population in America had remained stable since 1882, when Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, forbidding most immigration from China. But starting in 1965, Congress dramatically reversed its policy, allowing up to 20,000 Chinese to enter the country legally every year. Almost overnight, Chinatown was swamped with new arrivals from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China. Many were young men, often desperately poor and unable to speak English. They couldn't get work, so the only thing they had to do was go out on the street and, and, and scramble for themselves. It wasn't long before they began forming street gangs, Americanized versions of the secret brotherhoods of 18th century China, with ancient-sounding names like the Flying Dragons and the White Eagles. There was this big change going on, and it really created this power vacuum where if you were willing to do things such as menace people with weapons, you could make a living. Enter Nicky Louie. Ruthless and cunning, Nicky quickly rose to the top of a gang called the Ghost Shadows. You could stand in Chinatown and see maybe 25 or 30 Ghost Shadows standing on a corner without even knowing who he was. You would know who Nicky Louie was. He was the leader. They would look to him for everything. You didn't have to be Nicky Louie, but you could dress like him. You could like walk around like him. You could say, Fuck you, like him. You know, it was like a whole, it was a whole vista of how to act, you know? Under Nicky Louie's leadership, the ghost shadows graduated from petty theft to armed robbery and extortion. Their targets were often the restaurants that lined Chinatown's crowded streets. They would go to a restaurant owner and say, this young man just arrived from Hong Kong. Can you give him a job in your, in your restaurant? And we give him a job, $100 a week, $150 a week. 
the guy would show up once or twice and then never show up again and he still collected pay. That's an extortion. But the ambitious Nicky Louie had bigger plans. He wanted to take control of all of Chinatown. To do that, he needed to forge an alliance with one of the organizations that had long run the rackets in Chinatown, the Tongs. The Tongs were first established in the 1860s as benevolent associations to protect Chinese immigrant laborers from discrimination. These associations became the center of community life in most Chinatowns, a combination bank, social club, and city hall. But they didn't stay strictly benevolent for long. Some of the Tongs degenerated into criminal organizations. Uh, where they would operate uh, pro uh, house of prostitutions, uh, gambling parlors, uh, opium dens. In New York, criminal elements within the On Leong Tong had controlled the rackets on Mott Street, Chinatown's main drag since the turn of the century. But by the early 70s, gang violence was starting to disrupt their operations, especially their lucrative gambling houses. To put a stop to this, the Tong recruited one of the gangs, the White Eagles, to use his muscle. The ghost shadows were frozen out altogether, forced to operate on the fringes of Chinatown. But that didn't stop Nicky Louie. On the night of March 3rd, 1973, Nicky's crew saw a member of the White Eagles, Arthur Ha, standing alone on Mott Street. Shoving a gun into his ribs, the ghost shadows pulled him into a car and drove him to a pier on the East River. There, they tied him up, dragged him to the edge of the water, and tossed him into the swiftly moving current. His corpse was recovered several weeks later. The killing of Arthur Ha shook up Chinatown's underworld. And it showed that the Eagles were vulnerable in their own supposedly safe geographic area. Soon afterwards, the On Leong Tong adopted the ghost shadows as its muscle. Nicky Louie's takeover of Mott Street was now complete. But success made him a target. He was shot so many times it was said that when he rolled over at night, you could hear the bullets clank together. His ability to survive became part of his mystique, and his toughness became the stuff of myth. One legendary exchange allegedly occurred between Nicky and an NYPD detective as the gangster lay bleeding after being shot in the chest. So the detective asked him point blank, who shot you? And Nicky says, who are you? The New York City Police Department. And Nicky says, F you. <laughs> the telling you, tough kid. It wasn't just rival gangs that Nicky Louie had to watch out for. After the ghost shadows took over Chinatown, they were unhappy within their own group because some people were making more money than other people. So there were splits in their own group. On the night of August 28th, 1978, Nicky was engaged in one of his favorite pastimes, gambling on Mahjong in a basement barber shop on Mott Street. He had no time to react when a ghost shadow named Robert Sue, AKA Potato, pulled out a gun and shot him in the head. Miraculously, the bullet did not penetrate his skull. Nicky jumps up. And now he's running around the barber's chairs. And this is what he tells me. He hears the gun click, which means it's either empty or it misfired. He runs by the guy and out, runs to Canal Street, runs to Elizabeth Street, and walks into the station house and says, I'm shot. And why not the police station? There's no other killers there. I mean, he doesn't know who else is out there, does he? Two days later, Nicky Louie woke up in the hospital, surrounded by cops and prosecutors. He agreed to cooperate with the authorities and testify against his would-be assassin. But in doing so, he had to recount his own criminal history, including several murders. His testimony would come back to haunt him in 1985, when federal prosecutors used it to bring racketeering charges against Nicky Louie and 24 other ghost shadows. So it, it worked against him. You know, he put away the guy that shot him, but his own words probably helped make him plead guilty to the RICO. In October 1986, Nicky Louie was sentenced to 15 years in prison. His downfall and the demise of the ghost shadows 
marked the end of an era in Chinatown's underworld. There's no longer clear definition of necessarily who works for who and who controls what streets and what businesses. I don't see that clarity anymore. It's kind of now a potpourri of Asians willing to commit crime in a Chinese community. Since the founding of the Heaven and Earth Association more than two centuries ago, the Chinese underworld has survived and thrived, but it hasn't lost any of its mystery. Today in the US, it consists of an elusive array of constantly changing alliances, bonded only by the desire for profit. Involved in everything from heroin smuggling to human smuggling, they've recently begun for the first time to move beyond the boundaries of their own communities. They are willing to work with just about anybody as long as they can make money. And therefore, they become a much more significant threat to uh, the safety of the citizens of this country. It's not a simple task to clearly define Chinese organized crime today. It's very complex, it's very intricate. There's a lot of mirrors and there's a lot of smoke and it's a very difficult entity to penetrate.